Welcome to Globetrotter. This week we're on the Mississippi, and Paul Robeson sings Old Man River. Twenty-eight columns that represent the twenty-eight trees out front. Gilbert Joseph Pillier was a well-known architect. There is a rich history of plantation homes along the Mississippi. This home for Selena. Her father also knew how hot it does get down here during the summer. So he added a few features to the home that would keep Selena and Jacques cool during our hot Louisiana summers. These features included outside the 13 foot deep veranda we have. It encircles the whole house, keeping it in shade most of the day. Inside we have 12 and a half foot ceilings and solid brick walls that are 16 inches thick. Also, all the doors and windows to the home face one another on opposite ends of the house for cross ventilation. It took two and a half years to build their home. But as soon as it was completed in 1839, Selena could hardly wait to begin hosting her elaborate dinner parties she did love to have. And here at Selena's parties, there would be young ladies fresh from finishing school being escorted by their beau. One way a young couple's parents could keep an eye on them is with this mirror we have here on the front wall. This is called the Federal Bullseye Mirror, or as I like to call it, a chaperone mirror. <laughs> its unique design enabled the young couple's parents to view this room at all times. Another way young couples were kept in line back then is with this. It's called a quarter's candle. When the young gentleman arrived, the young lady's father would place a candle inside the candle holder and light it. Now, if her father approved of the young man and thought he was a good prospect for his daughter, well, her father then raised that candle high. Mm -hmm. But if her father disapproved of that young man, well, he then lowered that candle. And everyone knew, including the young man, that when the candle burned down to the top of the candle holder, it was time for him to say good night, and he better hurry back home. Selena was forced to turn the plantation over to Henri when he became of age in 1859. Now it's Henri himself. He is desperately trying to hold on to his father's plantation. But due to the South's loss of the Civil War and his mother's excessive spending, Henri is then forced to turn the plantation over to creditors on March 12, 1866. Two days later, at the age of 50, his mother Selena died here at Ocali, leaving only her debts as her legacy. And on December 15, 1866, the house, most of the furnishings, and 1,200 acres of land all went up for public auction, and everything sold for $32,800. After that, the plantation had many owners. Some were successful and some were not. But most of them only bought the plantation just to work the farm land. The house was neglected. As I mentioned earlier, this house was once abandoned. But in 1925, our last and most successful owners, Andrew and Josephine Stewart, purchased Oak Alley for $50,000. They spent an additional $65,000 in renovations. This is Mr. Andrew Stewart. He was a well-known cotton broker from New Orleans. Above and below are his parents. In the middle here, we have Miss Josephine Stewart when she was 35, and here she is again when she was two. Top portraits, Miss Josephine's grandmother. The middle portrait is her mother. And the bottom portrait, Miss Josephine's younger sister, Julia Mayhew Kaufman. That small black and white portrait on the end, that's Miss Josephine's father with her two younger brothers. The Stewarts loved O'Calley very much, but in 1946, Mr. Andrew Stewart died in the master bedroom. 
Mrs. Stewart could no longer sleep in there, so she packed her bags and moved right across the hall. Oh. Well, she didn't go too far. <laughs> to this room we call the lavender room. She had it decorated in her favorite color of lavender. And it's here in her lavender room. Mrs. Stewart passed away on October 3rd, 1972. She was 93 years old. The ladies of the house love to party and show off their beautiful homes. Welcome to the wonderful world of travel. I'm John Haggins, the Globetrotter. I'm here on the Mississippi, and this is the Mississippi Queen. I've been traveling for the past week, visiting plantation houses, part of American history, and also the levees which are protecting the cities. Oh, the Mississippi River is filled with great stories and traditions. Our country developed and migrated westward along the banks of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. This was the route for the early pioneers to move westward, early trade, early commerce, news, culture. It was all moving along these rivers, especially once the steamboats came along. Oh, I don't think on the Mississippi River you can pass up Mark Twain as one of the great heroes of the river. He is, in my opinion, the voice of the Mississippi. I've, I've always been um, partial to mothers. <clears throat> they have been denied much over the years. It was a long time before they were even permitted to vote. I've often wondered what this world would be like without mothers. Showboat, the movie, and the great old musical is a, is a part of this heritage. I always try and educate the passengers. There's only one problem with that great story. Fiction never happened. You see, the showboats were always barges. They weren't steamboats. They had not enough money to pay for a crew and fuel and pilots and all of that. They were literally floating rafts, theaters built onto rafts. And they would contract a steamboat to shove them to the next town. And then they'd do performances for as long as the money would hold out. They'd hire a steamboat and shove them to the next town. So it's a little blend of fact and fiction that's become part of our lore. But there still are some wonderful showboats. Matter of fact, there's still one operating right there at the public landing in Cincinnati, Ohio. And we dock right next to that beautiful boat. I was a farmer. Had a thousand acre farming operation. Hay, cattle, and pecans. William Ruffin Barrow, in 1822, married his first cousin, and they built Greenwood. Finished it in 1830. A cotton plantation in the beginning, then switched to sugar became very large, the third largest plantation in Louisiana. 12,000 acres, 1,100 slaves. It's huge. Here come the abolitionists. So the document on the mantle is the Ordinance of Secession, authored by this man, Bauer. Fit signature is his, and he's a hero. Civil War begins and he's killed on the front porch, Yankee Renegades, his children, inherit the place, and they strip it. Mm. Take the furnishings to their homes. They abandon Greenwood. After the war, no money, no labor, no horses, no mules, no nothing. Get rid of it. Visitors are welcome to tour the entire Greenwood mansion. These elaborate rooms reflect the time that's gone by. That's my fourth great-grandfather. He was born in 1770. My grandmother was Emma Damaray Barnes. She married the Yankee. There is a rich history of plantation homes along the Mississippi River. There's an old man called Mississippi. That's the old man that I want to be.